Freedom of Flood. We've been talking over the last couple of weeks about the, yeah, I'll say that, about the economy starting to move. You had the business cycle. Sometimes it's expanding. Remember, you expansion deep contraction across the business cycle, question one on it. But sometimes it's expanding, sometimes it's slowing down. And so then we got to talking about, well, what causes it to speed up and slow down? Well, it could be something on the supply side of things, or it could be something on the demand side of things. It could be something on the supply side of things for Carl growing his carrots, the yeah, supply side, the yeah, new technology allows him to use less pesticidization, money, more carrots get produced, so more jobs created, more carrots being sold, the economy moved, increased. Could be something negative, like, if some news comes out tomorrow that eating carrots makes people sick, so people stop eating carrots. Supply shocks, demand shocks, then monetary shocks. Did we? Did I talk about this slide? Or did I just sort of shoot it up? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah we talked about it somewhat. We, okay, we saw my talk. But, because we're going to go into a lot more detail about this over the next little bit. Uh, so, anything that hiccups that the producers have can speed up or slow down the economy. Hiccups that you and I as customers have can speed up and slow down the economy, and then actions that the government takes can speed up and slow down the economy. And I'll give a bit more detail on that in a slightly different show. But to sort of put things together, when we talk about GDP, and about half the time I end up teaching this chapter before I teach the national income government chapter that I did this time. Aggregate demand, extra credit question, what was it, number 25? Aggregate demand, aggregate, aggregate, that means total. There's total demand. What is total demand? Everybody's demand of everything you can venture. Here's a question that I forgot to remove. These are the questions I forgot to remove. So I turned to your credit and like one or two people like the other. And good on you. Um, by the way, the test each item was worth one point each. Make sure I counted correctly. If I miscounted it for benefit, which I was saying I'm doing. Um, if I miscounted and it cost you, let me know. I will fix um, Aggregate demand is our total demand for everything, all the goods and services. Where aggregate supply is. Ten slides away. Ten slides away. <laughs> Ten slides away. <laughs> oh. um, Every supply, I'll give you, it's everybody's supply of everything. Everybody's production. Every demand is all of our demand for watermelons, chicken sauce, and chickens. Every supply is everybody's supply of watermelons, chicken sauce, and chickens, et cetera, et cetera. So ultimately, and you put the two together, and that is what is how we measure the GDP. Every demand, to calculate it, is what is the demand for households, businesses, government, Net exports, aggregate demand is GDP, right? So, guess what can be on test number three? C plus I plus D plus F. <laughs> Visually speaking, our aggregate demand total is just it's a demand curve, but it's for everything. Instead of a demand for carrots, a demand for chickens, a demand for I started to say Dr. Pepper, but Jenny, you're drinking water. We sold out of Dr. Pepper vending machine, so. I'm sorry. Here we are. Here we are. So somebody's going to be a little bit twitchy here in the next little bit. Everybody be warned. Honestly, I only had one today, so I figured. And now I'm off my game. So, but, so instead of talking about Dr. Pepper, Sun Drop, Carrots, Chickens, it's stuff. If prices of stuff goes up, we're gonna buy less stuff, right? If the prices of stuff goes down, we're gonna buy more stuff, right? And that's what you see here. Right? What about hurricane? If price goes up, hurricane comes in. Uh more screw. <laughs> Hurricanes, natural disasters, they hit on a demand side. Yes, there is an, it's complicated, check. Hurricanes, 9-11 even, that y'all were like not alive for, or no, y'all were, we were, yeah. <laughs> 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 were in grade school, or 
I was like, I was one. <laughs> Dude, so I was close when I said y'all weren't alive yet. It barely made it go. Uh, I am so losing my frame of reference. Uh, gone with the day, so where were you when Reagan got shot? You were Reagan, dude. Anyway, uh, that's twice today. Okay, um, okay. Her games. Any kind of natural disaster or even 9-11. Demand is decreasing because people got killed, right? We just lost some customers. Man, is that evil? Right? That sucks. <laughs> That's, oh, they, 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 there's your economics is called the dismal science. And you guess what? You're knocking on the door for why? Okay. Wait, we lost some customers, right? So there's fewer people to be eating, buying bread, buying milk, right? Buying Dr. Pepper. But then you have an increase in the demand for other stuff. Like, oh, give me my eagle. Oh, caskets. Uh, uh, flower. Okay, plywood for, you know, uh, the natural desert. Plywood, generators, gasoline, duct tape, shingles, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, definitely water. Uh, <laughs> we know all too well about that. Yes. So, when dust settles, probably you're going to end up having a temporary increase in demand. Overall, even though you lost a little in some places, you gained some in other places. So, yeah, but, but you, we really, the hurricane, and that's why I, I hesitated to begin with, because there's a supply side of things too. Because businesses get damaged and then people lose their jobs because the business is like destroyed. So then those people are out of work, so their paychecks are lower, so their demand is going down. But then for those people that are like, well, I got I to gotta buy some plywood and shingles to fix my roof. Well, they don't actually have extra money coming from somewhere to do it. What happens? Right. You know, they're spending less money on video games and things, all the whatever fun stuff. That's all this fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they, they juggle their time. Uh, so the so you, you'll have an, an interesting amount of substitution going on there because of the hurricane. Instead of buying video games and stuff like that, I'm buying plywood instead. Um, instead of buying phone, I'm buying a generator instead. You get that kind of thing. But then there's well, the government's going to come and help with their government assistance, and so then that's going to be an increase in government spending to help us. And so they're just giving us money for us to spend for them. So overall, it's complicated. But you probably when it does. It just it depends. Same before the hurricane, yes. the price was high all the way to the top. We have a new demand curve, even if the price is high. Okay, no, the, no. If the if the companies are if the stores being evil and like uh, there's a hurricane coming, let's jack the price, jack the price up on our generators, kind of thing. We just all let it go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, you would be getting this, but. Because the hurricane is coming, you're also getting this. More people want generators today than they did before. So, yeah, they're raising the price, but guess what? The price was probably going to be going up anyway because of the increase in demand. So, they may just be thinking ahead and being a little bit evil about it, kind of thing. That's when I draw up aggregate supply in each life. But, I've already hinted at one of these. Why is that aggregate demand curve downwardly sloping? Why is that demand curve downwardly sloping? There's actually three reasons. Number one is the idea of wealth effect. Higher prices means lower purchasing power. Because Dr. Pepper got more expensive, what ended up happening? Jane can't afford to buy as many bottles, right? If she, unless she gets the pay rates to go along with it, right? When prices go up, we flat can't afford to buy as much. So yeah, when the price goes up, we're going to buy less. When the price goes down, we can buy more, right? That one, that, that one should hopefully probably is the first one that comes to our mind. We just can't afford to buy as much. Okay, well, what do you think? For my eating. Yeah. 
mean, seriously, bam, they gave her a touch screen. It used to be, uh, y'all are too young to remember, she used to have these little boxes that she had to spin around and then lit up and all that kind of stuff. So she had to keep up with stuff. Now she just touched the corner. I don't need to touch the corner. She's not even fingerprints and streaking up the screen in the middle of the screen. Just touch the corner. Seriously. Do we need Bama anymore? I mean, we kind of needed her when somebody had to manually spin the boxes around here. She was going to hear somebody's backstage doing it, but obviously there's somebody in there's programming all of them. I'll leave that one. Maybe. Oh. Uh, <coughs> the number two reason why the domain curve is not really sloping is the interest rate effect. Did I, did, when we were talking about inflation earlier, did I, I, I connect interest rates with prices? There's the price of stuff that's going to go up. Say, Haley lends me $100. She lent me enough money to buy 100 cans of Sundrop. Well, if the price of Sundrop goes up to $1.05, if I only pay her $100 back, what happened? She gave me enough money to buy 100 cans of Suntrop. I gave her enough money to only buy 95 cans of Suntrop. Haley, did you just lose? Yeah. So what's Haley going to say? Well, if I give you enough money to buy 100 cans of Suntrop, you need to give me at least enough money to buy 100 cans of Suntrop in the future. Suntrop's now cost $1.05 each. I need to pay Haley $105. So she went, so that makes her whole from having 100 cans of sun drop to having 100 cans of sun drop, right? So the higher the prices go up, the higher the interest rates go up. I should lose the money if I do it on the Well, in terms of cash, yes. She gives me 100, I give her 105 back. In terms of nominal income, whatever, yeah. Um, I just gave her an extra five dollars. But in terms of reality, she gave me enough money to buy a hundred cans of sun drop. I gave her enough money to buy a hundred cans of sun drop. It was even. But then what's Haley? Reality, what's Haley gonna do? She's gonna charge me an interest rate higher than that. To make up for the inconvenience of her not being able to buy any soda the whole time I'm holding on her money. Right? She's going to want to come up with, for the inconvenience. She wants to get rewarded for that inconvenience by having to wait until I show up to pay her back, if I show up to pay her back. So if the inflation rate is 5%, she's going to charge me like 10% or something like that, 5% to make her whole, and then another 5% to reward her for taking the risk. And knowing how risky I am, she can truly charge me 15 or 20% because I ain't making it back. I'm not giving you money. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pay you back, I promise. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so then when interest rates go up, we tend to slow down on borrowing money. And so higher interest rates means, you know, it's one thing to go buy a car, it's like 0% financial score. It's another thing to go buy a car, it's like 6%. <laughs> to buy a house, you got to pay 8 or 10 or 12%. So suddenly half of your house payment each month is going to nothing but paying off the interest. Welcome to what happened to people in 2008. But we'll save that conversation for another time. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try to not grab a hole uh, The third one is foreign purchasing effects. If prices are going up in the United States, that doesn't mean they're going up in the rest of the world. But if the prices are going up in America and they're not going up in Canada, then what happens? That makes Canadian products look cheaper compared to American products. So what's going to end up happening? Walmart is suddenly going to be sitting there saying, well, I could buy American or I could buy these cheaper Canadian products instead, score. And so what ends up happening? The American businesses end up selling less. Because we're choosing to buy the cheaper Canadian products. Walmart is choosing to sell us the cheaper Canadian products. So what ends up happening? Fewer American products are getting sold there. That is the foreign purchase effect. So you really have three things going on, and all three of them are helping to define the downward, the fact that the demand curve is downwardly sloping. Plus, there's the whole, well, I guess, I could throw it in a little psychology thing of, you know, it's expensive, and it's pretty thin, they kind of think about it. Any of you that think that way. 
The aggregate supply is everybody's supply of everything. Take everybody's supply for watermelons, chicken, chainsaws, fans, hot pepper, put all of it together. And then you have the total amount of stuff getting made within the country. Everyone supply of everything. And since I kind of like had those questions extra credit on this, and you kind of know what they'll look like on this. So when you put it together, oh, let me, okay. Remember how I said on uh, three slides earlier, I had the AD equals GB, GB equals C plus I plus G plus X. But if you're really bored, don't, don't, don't be this bored. Aggregate supply, that's going to be all of that. Rent plus wages plus interest plus net factor payments plus all that crap that I told you to never, never learn. So, in case any of you disobeyed and didn't learn, and did learn that, well, shame on you. If you OCD enough to learn it when I told you not to learn it, then you were OCD enough to appreciate the fact that I just closed that loophole there. <laughs> okay, so when you put the total demand for everything together with the total supply of everything, you get the total GDP. How much we're buying and how much they're making, put it together, and I guess how much is getting made of all. Because they're not going to make what we ain't going to buy. We're not going to buy what they ain't going to make. Right? So that's why I told you. You, the two different ways to measure GDP is going to get you to the same place because that's where it ends up. And by definition, this ends up determining the price level. So then each year things happen that change supply, change the business's willingness and ability to produce, and change our demand, change our willingness and ability to buy, and depending on how much that supply increases or decreases, how much the demand increases or decreases is going to determine how much prices are going to change. So, and here's a dirty little secret that I mentioned the other day. Frog five times in this semester. Demand, if nothing else changes, demand is going up because our population is going up, right? So we need more stuff. So what ends up happening? There is this natural tendency toward inflation, toward prices going up. Because there's this push of just more humans. Even if they those humans are doing nothing but eating and pooping while well, they're eating and pooping and the food is eating the diapers that they're pooping and I hope. Not on the streets. Um, there is this. And so hopefully we can do things like get technology increases and that kind of stuff that will help even things out but to you know offset some of that extra upward pricing pressure thing thing. So it's kind of the aggregate demand kind of has a 3% head start over supply when it comes to growing, which is why we have a tendency for prices to go up. We think of prices going up a whole lot more often than we think about prices going down, don't we? Prices of some things go down. Just a few years ago, gasoline was $4 a gallon. Now it's less than three. There's a few years ago that milk was $4 a gallon. Now it's $2. So, um, but so some of the prices do go down, some of they go down, they go up. Well, you mentioned diapers a minute ago. You were kind of joking, but I've noticed um, like the boxes of diapers and stuff, so, um, a soccer food program kind of stuff. I've noticed that the prices are staying the same, but they're downsizing the amount of diapers you put in the box. Yes. The Big Mac ain't, that y'all are eating ain't the Big Mac I was eating when y'all, I was y'all say. Big Macs are smaller, the Wendy's single is smaller, all of this hamburger, the, the food size, that is a price increase. Because if you look at it, how much you paying per ounce of meat, how much you paying per diaper, not how much you paying for the box of diapers, yep. it just 
cheating on the portion size is a price increase. And it's just not a like. It, it sucks. Yeah, it, it, it's sticky, but it's heavy. Yes. It should be what it should be. Because otherwise, now what do I got to do? You know, I got to go and get a Walker with cheese and a Walker Jr. Seriously. Yeah. I accidentally did a couple weeks ago. I accidentally ordered two Walkers instead of getting the Jr. So I'm like, okay, and then I eat them both anyway. Oh, oh my God. What? <laughs> 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 Directed minds around that the Great Depression was a 40% decrease in GDP over three years. Just 40 in the first three years alone. But 40 is almost hell. Almost, we cut the amount of stuff that was being made almost in half, which means we cut the number of jobs almost in half in only three years' time. Makes this little 12 for the, the, our unemployment going from 6 to 7 to 12 percent, a drop in the bucket. I mean, it, that was the second worst that we had, I kind of think, for they decided, but it's still, compared to the, this, this is why people were throwing themselves out of buildings in the Great Depression, human suicide, that kind of thing, because it was just freaking ugly. Just. Okay, okay I telegraphed a few slides too early. Population is growing, so our labor force is growing. So population is growing, aggregate demand is growing. Well, hopefully, as population is growing, our labor force is growing too. We we'll get three percent more people. Well, we get three percent more high school graduates that are going out to the workforce to make the extra stuff that those three percent people are going to be eating and drinking and wearing and smoking. You know who you are. So populations grow. So we need job creation to keep up with the growing labor force. So if we have 8 million people graduating high school this June, then suddenly we're like, well, we didn't have a job, and now we got to get a job. The mom and dad are saying, get a job. All right. Well, what happens if we don't have jobs for them? They're unemployed. They're unemployed. Yeah, we haven't gotten to the labor chapter yet. No. Yeah, but they, they, those people are unemployed, so our unemployment rate just starts climbing, climbing, climbing. And that kind of sucks, even for those that we, we talked about, before, those of us that have a job. It sucks for us when unemployment is high because the more people out of work, the less need our bosses have for giving us a pay raise because we're more easily replaceable. So this is actually a good time for y'all to be having a job because the unemployment rate is kind of low, very low. So this is not a bad time for you to ask for a raise. Unlike you know, a few years ago, I was advising us students that you know, maybe you, you have value in saying, you know, prices went up by 3%, I need a 3% raise, but maybe you ought to you know, don't go way farther than that, but now's okay time to ask. But use your own judgment. If you get fired, don't blame me. So we need jobs to be created in order to keep up with population growth. So in order to get those jobs, real GDP has to grow. Businesses aren't going to hire more people unless there's people going to make more stuff. Right? If we're not going to make more stuff, we're not going to hire more people, there is going to be no job creation. So something needs to happen to spur on the growth in real GDP. Stuff needs to be getting made. And it needs to grow at least as fast as the population, probably more so. Due to efficiencies and other details we're not going to get into. Because if we don't, if the economy doesn't grow at the same rate, if the real GDP is not growing at the same rate as the population rate, we're going to get unemployment, we're going to get higher prices, we're going to get higher imports, which means even fewer jobs here in the United States. Are we with Okay, so we're going to be kind of Theoretical for the rest of the day. Yeah. Well, I mean, if the people that should be going to jail block in suppliers, I mean, reduce the price so they can do so many things. Is that one thing? Why should I lower my price? I mean, if everybody was, I mean, lower the price of the government, what's the lower the price of the United States? Uh, so you 
mean when you lower the price, the rest of them lower it and that's not gonna make you mad at the person. But why would I, as a convenience store in Lawrenceville, Virginia, why should I feel like I need to be responsible for the entire country's economy and I need to be the one that's deciding that inflation is too high and I need to be the one to start snowball downhill. But I'm going to take control and I'm going to lower my prices knowing the other gas stations in town are going to lower their prices and hopefully that's going to spread throughout the entire county, throughout the entire state, throughout the entire nation. No, no. That ain't my thing to do. And what if I... What if it doesn't work? I lowered my prices and got absolutely nothing other than less money. That's kind of like um, like gas stations that like say it's, I pass a gas station gas like two forty five and then I go up the street like two miles the gas is like two seventy nine. Yeah, it's like the same thing, right? Well, yeah, the, and, and that's the, how sensitive or what we'll is how sensitive are the customers and the changing of price for us? Yep. The gas station across the street is going to have the same price. But down the street, it may be 10 cents difference because they know that people aren't willing to drive the extra five miles, 10 miles to go save 10 cents a gallon because we, yeah, they may save a buck or two, but they're going to burn a buck or two worth of gas, so we ain't got to do it. Uh, take my marketing class this time next year. We just talked about that kind of thing last, well, this past Monday. The law of one price, but I'm not going to go there because you're not going to get me down another rabbit hole. <laughs> I lie. That's it. So, but uh, but private businesses are like, well, there's a reason why they're raising their prices. I'm not raising my price because I want to. Businesses, if anything, they want to lower their price to increase their sales. But what is it that's causing the price, the companies to raise their prices? It's probably, you know, it's costing them more to buy the stuff that they're putting on their shelves, so they got to pass that cost on to the customers. It costs more to put the gas in the gas in the tanks that you're going to be pumping from. To put the sodas in the coolers and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of I'm raising my prices because I have to, and I got to hire more people because I'm selling more. Well, and then maybe I got to raise my price too because the people I'm hiring aren't as capable of workers as my already experienced workers that I already have. The prices companies usually aren't going to go woohoo. Raise the prices, score. Not unless, not unless they're a very evil. B pretty close to being a monopoly, or C, they're an inefficient producer that's struggling and their competition's pretty tough. And they get a little bit of wet work, but we'll talk about that one later on, too. There, that goes back to A, evil. But I did not say that I am not recording. In case you didn't hear the name of the company, I'm not sure. They can because they don't care about market share. And their demand is what we call inelastic. We'll talk about it in 202. The customers don't go away. Their customers aren't frightened on the fact that they're the highest priced iPhone went from $600 to over $1,000 over the last few years. People are still supporting the iPhone. But people, but Apple is interestingly, I think they're, they're finding the ceiling. Because they have the XS. Think about it. The 10S. What is it? XS. XS. Right? Except it's excessive to spend a thousand semi dollars on a right. They, they named it right, even though they didn't name it right. But anyway, but they came out with the XS and then they're coming out with the X or the 10. Yes, they're coming out with the 10R that just came out yeah, on Tuesday. That's basically it's, it, it's the 10S, but a little bit less. And namely, instead of a metal back, it's more of a plastic glass back. But in 13 different colors to choose from, including Dinian yellow, so you need to just draw a couple circles on it and you have Dinian right to stick. Anyway, uh, but you know, a bunch of colors, most of the specs, most of the internals are the same, and it just ain't as much metal and it ain't as much. And instead of like three cameras or something, two or something like that, because it's like $300 less, and they sold out in like a day. Or two because yeah. people are like it's it's an iPhone X something, it's an iPhone 10 something. It's better than last year's iPhone 10, it sure is better than the 8, and it don't cost a thousand dollars. And I think that it, Apple's starting to discover that that extra what not much oomph for the extra 200 300 dollars. People are sort of like, 
but there's always going to be those people that are going to buy into it. Oh yeah, there's a bunch of people that yeah, they, they they bought the iPhone 10s, 10s Pro or Max or whatever oh, they call yeah. it, surfboard size one. But yeah. Okay. Okay, I wasn't gonna let you drive me down a rabbit hole, and then I got drunk by down down one anyway. So I thought you drove me into like a long weed in the I guess it is. Doesn't it um, put in less workers for more money? Because they get to make more money selling less. Yeah, that, that, that's a nice thing for Apple. They're in this position of they're getting more money doing less work. And, and they're okay with that. Um, but there's a lot of companies. But they can do that because the customers are willing to pay the more money. Most everybody else is like, I ain't paying a thousand dollars for Samsung. Okay, maybe some people I'll pay a thousand dollars for Samsung. I ain't gonna pay a thousand dollars for LG, for an HTC, for a TCL, for a Huawei, for an Honor Mate, like a Razer Pro. That's the one had the the going and never went top back. Okay, so. In the, in the long term, the economy, it sort of goes up, it goes down kind of thing. You had the expansion. You, you know, I'm talking Great Depression, recessions, recovery, this kind of stuff in long span. We're going to focus more on the shorter term here. In the short term, the economy has some ups and downs. Like I talked about last week, when you drive a new car, even though it's on cruise control and it's supposed to be saying that 74, sometimes you look down and you're doing 75, sometimes you look down and you're doing 73, right? So there's always a little bit of instability. There's always something going on. When we talk about labor, there's everywhere in America, somewhere today, there's somebody who's quitting their job because they're getting mad. There's some teenager who's flipping off their boss and leaving. Somewhere else in America right here today, there is some teenager who's getting fired for incompetence, right? The, the, the economy is always moving. And there's friction there. So, in short term, there's two competing theories for what's going on for this instability here. One of the supply, one of the supply based, and the other is demand based. But both are actually bizarre, focusing on aggregate demand. Both of these supply theories and demand theories are saying, okay, it's all about demand. The potential for aggregate demand to change the economy. So, supply side, control it. Supply siders, they're going to say, I'm trying to determine how much y'all want to write down about this. Try, try, try to mentally go, go on the journey with me. Um, you can come back and get the slides or whatever later as you need or whatever, but just try to take, try to take the journey with me. Okay, I talked about if aggregate supply doesn't increase fast enough, you're going to get inflation, right? But what happens if aggregate supply must actually decrease? That's a big problem, right? You're going to get a whole lot of inflation. Now you get some if it just doesn't happen to grow fast enough, but if you don't grow at all, if you tricks, you're going to have some problems. So if aggregate supply decreases, you're going to get more inflation, more unemployment, Less stuff being made. The economy is going to shrink here. So, what's going to cause aggregate supply to decrease? It's harder for businesses to do business. It's harder for them to make stuff. Right? So, if it's flip side, is if you can increase aggregate supply, you're going to get closer to price stability. If we can get aggregate supply to grow at least to equal to the growth of aggregate demand, boom. Maybe if we can get it to grow faster, prices might actually go down for a change every once in a while. Would that be refreshing? Change pace. And we can come close to full employment because if we're making more, if our supply is increasing more than demand, whatever, then we're making more, making more, making more, hiring more people. So increasing aggregate supply is a fantastic thing. Shrinking aggregate supply can cause a boatload of troubles. How are we going to get so prices? We'll get to all of that in a little bit. The yeah, answer, bank and bill is taking itself. No, ultimately no. So, um, so we want growth. So the supply side theory is saying, well, if we want growth, we need to increase productivity. 
get more work out of our workers. Get them to make more. More t-shirts per hour. More hammers per hour. More words typed per minute. That comes from increased productivity, new technologies, like you, know, you have, what's the example, like two secretaries banging away on typewriters got replaced by one administrative assistant using a computer, right? A technology, yeah, somebody lost your job, well, free them up to do something else to participate in the economy because all the typing is still getting done by one person instead of two. So then you, that other person's capable of hopefully doing some other job or working another computer at another company and doing even more typing, right? So the goal here is if we can get increased productivity, get increased technology, the government doesn't need to intervene. This is the thinking here. If the government is going to get involved, the only thing the government should do, according to supply suppliers, is to do things that will help increase technology and productivity. Get out of the way of business, but if you are going to do anything for business, it should be to help business do business. Overall, markets are self-correcting because the business ain't going to make stuff that people aren't going to buy, so you ain't got to worry about it, right? So the market's going to self-correct. Uh, what, what, uh, what political party am I talking about here? <laughs> yeah, Republicans. Get, there, get out of the way. You do what you want to do. Let me do what I want to do. Right? That's Republican philosophy. Get out of the way. If things is easier for business, if it's easier, cheaper, more effective for businesses to make stuff and build stuff, they'll be able to make it and build it at a lower price. And if they build it at a lower price, we'll be buying more of it. And if we're buying more of it, guess what? They're going to have to make even more of it, and they're going to be creating jobs. So it's this nice, beautiful thing. And maybe along the way, prices are going to be going down too. Score. That's the thinking there. Well, we'll get down. We'll get to the Democrats in a few of But visually, this is what we're talking about: increased aggregate supply. And what do we get? To go along with the fact, well, our population is increasing, right? So, if we can increase aggregate supply, oops. If we can increase aggregate supply, if the price changes. It ain't a whole lot. But what do we have? Real economic growth. More bulldozers, more chainsaws, more jobs. Right? That's the dream here. Is there anything wrong with that? This is a win, 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 win. And I'm not going to sit here and say, vote Republican because Sam just asked a question. What's the catch? And there's a catch. The demand siders that the Democrats tend to lean toward comes from the views of an economist, John Maynard Keynes, back in 1920. He's saying, well, if people aren't spending enough, that can slow down an economy. He's like, yep, aggregate demand increases. We're getting more population, but still, we beyond that, we've got to have more spending growth to pull along creating jobs. And if demand isn't high enough, you're going to have unemployment. Because what he's saying is the driver for the economy is the customer. If you and I don't want it, and you and I don't buy it, they ain't going to be selling it, which means they ain't going to be making it, which means they ain't going to be hiring people to make it. Right? Unemployment. So ultimately, here's where it comes from. This shift in aggregate supply. Let me go back to the slides because I don't have it here. I'm looking for it. This increase in aggregate supply here. Where did it come from? The increase in aggregate supply came from productivity and technology. Where does that come from? Us humans, capital. Us humans, capital. Yes. How how predictable is this? It's not. Not very. How stable is this? 
When is the next big thing? When is the next new idea? When is the next new innovation going to go? Whenever someone has an idea. Whenever somebody has an idea that they can't act on, and hopefully current technology or whatever will allow them to do that. We get, the economy grows and fits and starts. We're kind of driving around in horse and wagons for hundreds of years, and somebody come around and made a train. Score! Well, a few years later, somebody came up with a car. Woohoo! A little bit later, the Ray Brothers airplane. Okay, I take my airplane and board or we get Right? Okay, y'all don't know the world before the internet. Y'all don't know the world before cell phones. The world, the, the world changed, but it's in fits and starts. Yeah, the cell phones, now y'all can take your online classes on the five in the screen, which is absolutely insane. Don't do it, but if it wasn't for online technology, the internet, higher speed internet, Half of the students in South Aberdeen Community College would be not students in South Aberdeen Community College because they can't afford to quit their jobs to come to college. But the internet that hit 20 some odd years ago, what's next? Smartphones hit 10 years ago, what's next? What's the next thing that's going to give oomph to our workers? Robots. <laughs> <laughs> Robots. Yeah. Okay. It's a self-driving tractors. If you use that one, they do I think the GPS. So you can have one farmer say one farmer driving one tractor, no one farmer's driving eight tractors because he's got the drone flying overhead and he's right. trying to GPS yeah. program to go up and down the field. They're just out there just doing one person doing work of five. Well, ooh, crap. And we got potentially four unemployed people. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> so this it's beautiful when it works, but it's working, it's kind of unpredictable, right? It's kind of unpredictable. So, let me get back to it. Here we go. In the long run, it'll pan out. The, well, if just go to just <laughs> yeah. In the long run, we're all dead. So here we go. You had a the, the two secretaries banging oh. away the typewriters. Give me their names. Amy and Betty. Amy and Betty. Which one do we not like? Betty. Okay. <laughs> Betty. Oh, yeah. Oh, Babysitter, someone being Betty. <laughs> oh, that third grade teacher we all had. No. <laughs> Amy and Betty, two typewriter secretaries doing work. Bam! Betty loses her job because Amy is a computer. Right? Oh. Okay. So <laughs> Amy is the administrative assistant. That because of a computer, she doesn't have to deal with whiteout and all that kind of stuff anymore, instant correcting, not wasting paper, all that stuff. One secretary, one administrative assistant. With a two thousand dollar computer, or nowadays it's like a five hundred dollar computer, could do the work that it took both Amy and Betty to do in the past, right? So the work is getting done by one person instead of two. Well, Betty, in the long run, what can she do? Well, she can come to Southside Virginia Community College, take it, get a two year degree in information technology, and then she can go out and get herself another job. That's why it takes college. Yes, it is. <laughs> but can Amy, can Betty afford that? Probably not. Because Amy, because Betty have the money to allow her to not work for two years while she's here at Southside, getting her education. Yes, Because she just lost her job. Hopefully, she had savings. But what if Betty's thirty-two years old with three kids? No. So Betty's homes, right? In the long run, hopefully, you know, in the long run, she can get financial aid and she takes one class a semester. She graduates eight years from now or something like that. In, in, in the long run, stuff can happen. But in the short run, Betty just lost her job now and she's got to eat now. She's got to pay next month's rent. In the short run, she's got problems. In the long run, we'll be okay when the recession hit in 2008. People lost their jobs because interest rates adjusted and people stopped spending as much. Spending went down, businesses were laying people off, but then they're like, well, when things pick up, we'll hire you back. But in the meantime, people are getting hurt in the adjustment period. In the long run, Betty comes to Southside, and in a couple of years, she gets her associate's degree, and through financial aid, she can get it tuition free. 
This year, we just got plenty of buying groceries for the kids and that kind of stuff, right? Good luck, Benny. In the long run, she'll be okay. And in the long run, maybe she'll be better off because she's going to have an IT degree from here and she could be working at Microsoft in Boyton, right? So 35 years from now, she'll be okay if she can give you the speed bump of these next few weeks, months, and a couple of years. In the long run, we're okay. In the long run, we're all dead. In the short run, we can't ignore the people that are getting lost in the transition because generally, Keynes is saying that at every supply, what he's saying is it, it is growing. When it grows, it's beautiful. The new technology, the new productivity, all that kind of stuff, it's all fantastic, but it ain't happening fast enough. And if it ain't happening fast enough, then you're gonna have people like Betty that are gonna get left behind. And we can't leave Betty behind. So what we need to do is make sure that there's enough spending out there Betty won't lose her job, or if she does lose her job, there's other jobs out there available for her. So, if you and I as human beings aren't spending enough to keep the economy growing fast enough, the government is going to take off the glass and take off the tie and rip it open and put a Superman shirt and come out there and they're going to take the bullet for us. If you and I aren't spending enough, well, the government should increase their spending to make up for your and my shortfall, to bring that stability. That's what they actually do. And they actually do the government stimulus. Have you all heard that phrase? That's exactly what that was. We went from 6% unemployment to 12% unemployment. We had 12,000, I mean 12 million extra unemployed workers here in the United States. That's 12 million people that aren't getting paychecks anymore. So aren't spending money in Walmart or food line and so on. So what ended up happening? The government did spending to make up the spending they didn't do. They spent some of it extending unemployment benefits. Instead of them getting checks for six months, they could get checks for up to three years. The government spent some of the money fixing schools, fixing bridges, fixing highways. They were doing the spending because you and I weren't doing the spending because some of us screwed up and bought houses that we shouldn't have. Because we got suckered by a loan officer that was looking to make another deal. Because interest rates were historically low thanks to Osama bin Laden. Moving right along. Let's pull that one together. Okay. So, for you visual learners, this is what Keynes is saying. I agree, supply does go up, it ain't quite enough. So, in order to get our real GDP growth, we have to do what? Get a big increase in spending. In order to get the same amount of growth that we had, that I had pictured on the last slide, right? To get that same amount of growth, if supply doesn't do it, you gotta get extra demand in order to make it happen. So, instead of two or three percent spending growth, we might need six or seven or eight percent spending growth in order to get the three percent job growth that we're looking for. So, the nice thing about this, this one is fast. Because the government can look at the economy and say, that's a problem, let's cut some more checks. That's fast. Whereas, when is the next new technology that's going to make us work faster? Crap knows when that one's going to hit. When are we going to actually get the next battery technology that will replace the lithium ion batteries we've been struggling with for years? No. It's going to be a while. And that's what we really are going to need in order to for these electronic car, electric cars to really get serious about them. It's the next generation of batteries. But well, they've been knocking on that door for years. We still have cracked and tried that with the Note 7, and they all explode. That was just trying to cram too much lithium ion yeah. into one area, yes. But yeah, just when is the next thing going to happen? So, this is fast. It ain't slow. This is predictable because the government can predict it. They can say, well, this is how much spending we think needs to happen, and then look and see how much we did, and then they do the rest. Easy. But there's some issues there. Number one, prices go up because demand is growing much faster than supply. So you will have inflation when the government does this. No, 
they do this to recover the economy if the economy is slowing down, this is how they speed it up. If the economy is slowing down because people are losing their jobs, they're going to try to turn it around that way. To fight inflation, if you're getting inflation, sometimes inflation is a good thing. Businesses are being more productive, and right? I got to hire Matthew and Connor, they need to run their bakery a second shift, and they got to hire more workers who want to be baking cakes at 2 o'clock in the morning. Well, if you're going to have me baking them at 2 o'clock in the morning instead of 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you got to pay me extra, right? So those workers are going to get paid extra, and then there's extra ovens, refrigerators, stuff they got to buy, so they're going to have to jack their costs and stuff. That's kind of a good kind of inflation that we'll talk about when we get to the inflation. No, we already talked about it before. Is cost inflation the main goal of inflation rate of Okay, that must be in the next semester. But cost push, that's when you cost force you to have to raise prices. Demand pull is when the customers are like buying more, buying more, and that's but anyway. Uh, but if the economy is going too fast, then wages are gonna be going if too fast, wages are gonna be going up a lot, prices are gonna be going up a lot, and that can cause problems too. If the prices are going up a lot, well, that's fine if your paycheck is going up a lot. But it sucks if your paycheck is staying the same. If you're a fixed income person, look at your retirement benefits because of your social security checks, that kind of thing. You kind of get hosed. If you're a small business looking to hire somebody, and I used to hire somebody for $8 an hour, now I've got to pay $9.50 or $10 an hour to employ the same person, that's kind of tough to me to hear. Especially when these people are going to be goofing off and sleeping on the job and worse playing and stealing stuff all day long. You know who you are. So. When does it doesn't, you have the two theories. They both are, they're okay. One of them is if you can take the long view and get through the adjustment period, make life easy for business, everybody's going to win. That's the supply side point of view, that's the Republican point of view, and it actually works. If it's fast enough. But the Keynesians and by extension the Democrats are like, that ain't happening fast enough. So we the government need to step in and tweak things. But then unfortunately when we step in and tweak things, when we kind of break other things, we screw up inflation, we screw up interest rates, we screw up demand for other various products along the way. So then we kind of have to handle those adjustments along the way too. Because kind of the government, believe it or not, they have this kind of belief that if they they crack, if, if they break something, they kind of have to fix it. This sort of so. the other type of theory is a monetary theory. This is actually getting down to cruise control, doing its little language adjustments here. Is if not. I'm not talking a recession or depression or something like that. I'm just talking about a tiny little slowdown or a tiny little speed bump over a month or two. In this case, the government can do the Federal Reserve or the government that's the discretionary. They can make the decision of, well, we're going to speed things up a little bit. We're going to slow things down a little bit. Just by printing more money or printing less money or in, in turning our influence on interest, interest rates to raise them or lower them a little bit. That will speed up or slow down things a little bit. Okay. Use your imagination. I'm so glad you asked. Pretend like this is Spider Man comic book number one from the year 1952, whatever year it came out. How many of these are there out there in the world? Not many. So, what do you got to give me to get this? A lot. But what if there are thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of these things? They're everywhere. So what do you got to give me to get this? Not a whole lot. Well, replace the word Spider-Man comic book with $10 bill. If there's $10 bills everywhere, what do you got to give me to get a $10 bill? Not a whole lot. If their $10 bills are very, very, very hard to find, what do you got to give in order to get it? A lot more. So when there's more and more money out there, everybody's like, I got plenty of money, so you're, that money isn't worth the whole lot. You expect me to work for this money that's almost worthless? You expect me to get off my couch and work for money that's almost worthless? You expect me to give you two cases of sun drops for this money that's almost worthless? 
No, the more money there is out there, that's going to be influencing inflation. If that money is worth less, that means the money is expensive compared to, uh, it's cheap compared to the product. That's expensive compared to the product. Oh, you're right. So, but it, it, it breaks that relationship. But yes. It happened in Germany. I was just about to say, right after World War I, yeah. they had wheelbarrows full of money to pay for all the money. Yes, the, as a good history call back, yes, absolutely, Germany approached World War I, and that's part of the, part of the, one of the things that led to World War II is the German economy, once they got, the money got so cheap, it was almost worthless, so they had all this money that they had to pay back France and England and Belgium and whoever, and the money they paid back was almost worthless. They were burning it, it was so worthless. Yeah, for fire. Um, countries like that have higher inflation, like Brazil, the, I mean, it's like, it, it, back in the 80s, it's like 8,000% inflation rate per year. I mean, you go on vacation in Brazil, you get your money in American dollars as long as humanly possible. Because you take a ten dollar bill in Brazil, you hand it to the, hand it to the person when you get off the airplane, and they give you a thousand real, and you hold on to that thousand real until the end of the week, and you didn't spend any of it. You go back and you hand it to them with spending a ten dollar bill, and they give you like one or two back. Because that's how much the because the inflation rate was just that high because corrupt government they just kept printing money, printing money, printing money, printing money, and it was just it was just completely worthless. So, so printing more money. Which actually is coming to the next slide here, but then you can go ahead and take it real. But money and credit, the amount of money that's out here is going to affect our ability and willingness to buy things. If you could borrow money to the bank for 0% interest, would you? Yeah. Maybe, yeah. If you could borrow money to the bank and you had to pay 20% interest, yeah. forget about it, right? If, so, if your credit is available or the credit is too expensive, high interest rates, then the amount that we're going to buy is going to be reduced. But if interest rates are going down and it's easier for us to borrow, we'll spend more. Okay, so I didn't have that other slide there because um, we actually call, come back to it in the later fiscal policy and then monetary policy chapter. So, oh, I just went wrong. Now. But basically, we, this, we have a whole chapter on it. Chapter, I'm going to call it 13 or 14. I don't know what number it is. Uh, fiscal policy is going to be the next chapter that we get to. Whatever the day is. Next week then. I'm confident. You like that? Overall, the government, if they want to mess with the economy, they have fiscal policy. Fiscal. This is, have you ever heard of somebody having fiscal, a business having fiscal year, fiscal budget? It's hard to work on. What fiscal, what, I've got slides for each of these. But this is a cheap question on a test for government policy options, fiscal, monetary, great policy. I keep clutching this one. That's nice to work for you, jazz musician. Any of you listen to jazz? Okay, well, unless somebody has an eclectic taste in music, listen a little bit of this, a little bit of that. That's eclecticism. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. That's economic theory. Eclecticism. Eclecticism. Fiscal policy is where the government changes the amount of taxes that they charge and the amount of spending they do in order to make the economy. This is the government saying, we don't think people are spending enough, we're going to spend more. Then they figure out what they're going to spend it on. They've made the decision, I'm going to spend more, I'm going to spend less. Then they work out the details. Well, what do we think? We want our politicians to do. Well, I want you to look at an idea, examine the idea, and decide is it worth it to spend the money to do this project or not. But instead, the government is coming at it saying, "Well, we're going to spend the money, and we're going to see this is how much we want to spend, how much we need to spend, and let's find ways to spend it." Yeah, back in 2008-2009, they were fixing bridges and painting schools, that kind of stuff, whether they needed it or not. Not because the highway needed it, maybe it did, maybe it didn't, but because the highway workers needed to keep their jobs. That's the thinking there. The economy's slowing down, we're going to do extra spending. If the economy's speeding up, we're going to cut, reduce our spending. Uh, the goal is we're going to adjust how much we spend based on where the economy is, not based on necessarily the idea of the project. So they're trying to 
Remember C plus I plus D plus X? You're messing with G here. Okay, that's called back to the untouchables movie. You're messing in you just think. <laughs> but uh Sean Connery uses the word that begins with F right, but where did you so I can anyway. Increasing the G to speed up the economy, C plus I plus D plus X, if G goes up, the GDP goes up, right? If G goes down, the GDP goes down, and that's their goal. If we want GDP to go up, let's move the G up. Monetary policy is going to be where the federal government is going to do things to mess with interest rates or print more money to mess with our spending and business spending. If interest rates are higher, businesses aren't going to be borrowing as so much money to buy bulldozers and stuff. If interest rates are higher, you and I aren't going to be borrowing as so much money to buy houses and cars. Right? So this is messing with monetary monetary and credit controls. We got a whole chapter for example, uh, to manipulate the economy. Ultimately, manipulating our C and our I is equal to I plus C plus I. Is this the same thing where the government made banks have like a quota on risky loans? Yes. Yeah, all that stuff is here. Chapter, I guess they were things. So the more money the government spent, the more cash the funds. That is part of the headache there. If the government is spending more money, where is that money coming from? Who is the government? We the people. So if they're spending it, we got to pay for it. So yeah, it's nice that they're spending money to increase the economy and create, protect jobs and all, but guess what? Whose money are they spending? Mine, and they're going to come and get it, right? Either. Somewhere along the line, taxes are going to have to go up. So it's either like you spend it yourself yeah. or take it from you spend it. Yeah, there's a little bit of that there. <laughs> but they're doing it because you aren't spending it well enough. <laughs> but that's chapter 12. So trade policy, okay, we've done C, I, and G, so all we got left is X, right? Trade policy, they can do things to alter the rules for trade to make it easier for foreign companies to sell their stuff to American companies or make it harder for foreign companies to sell their products to American companies. And by doing that, that's going to be manipulating the productivity of American businesses and sales for American businesses that will speed up or slow down their money. Uh, the whole steel and aluminum tariff, that's kind of hitting Caterpillar, the bulldozer company. They can hit twice because the, the steel tariffs, it's, it costs them about 8 10% more to build a bulldozer than they did a few months ago. That's a decrease in supply there, right? There, that hurts. But then also, interest rates are going up. Trying to get them back to where they should be. So that means, guess what? Home sales growth is slowing down. Businesses borrowing money, build new buildings, that kind of stuff is slowing down. And who is it that's where the bulldozers get used? In building stuff, right? So they get hit a second time. And then, okay, interest rates are going up. Well, how many of you have like 50, 60, 80,000 dollars to drop on brands and bulldozers to pay cash? So the customers need, need to borrow money in order to buy their product, and interest rates are going up. There's nothing to hit three times there. Bulldozer, I mean, cap, uh, Caterpillar stock has dropped like 8% in the last few days, kind of thing. If you, we talk about the leading and lagging and coincidental little indicators. Good leading indicator of the economy is to look at the stock of Caterpillar. Because if people think the economy is going to be growing, they can be buying the bulldozers to do the building in order to grow the economy, right? Caterpillar is a nice company to look at and try to gauge the growth of the economy. But anyway, the trade rules, manipulating the economy, is going to be adjusting how much money is coming in and out, that net exports, making exports go up or down, making imports go up or down, change that calculus. So that's messing with an X, so we mess with C plus I plus D plus X. Or eclecticism is what? Well, we do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Ronald Reagan was a Republican. They're for small government, and they should be balanced budgets. The budget spending when Reagan was in office went up. Clinton, Democrats, they're more for, if anything, we need to be doing the spending. The government deficit improved while Clinton, the Democrat, was in office. Because they were doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Didn't neither the Republicans or the Democrats in the last 40 years have strictly followed classical or Keynesian economic theory according to the way we described the last 30 minutes? Yeah, they what they should have done. Because they're doing what's working now. 
because I want to get my butt reelected. So what's going to work the best to get me reelected? Well, I'm a Republican and I can do extra spending in order to get reelected. Score. I'm a Democrat. I can cut taxes in order to get reelected. Score. So, so it's like because I'm just doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that, whatever, whatever it takes to, to win. Welcome to, Demo uh, welcome to politics. That's the word. I start to say Democrats. I start to say Republicans. But it's everybody. <laughs> you had another question? Uh, uh, minimum wage, I think, went up while Clinton was in, and then it went up again while George W. Bush was in. That's when it went up early in his life. It didn't went up seven quarters. I don't know. It's not national. So, yes, not national. So we'll talk about that when we get to whatever that chapter is. So, we finished the chapter. We will do chapter. Oh, door. Chapter 8, let us mind it is next. And then we'll play Oh, two, three, take the order to leave behind. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. We had to Yeah, yes, we do. Yeah, we still have a question.